Hello, uh, welcome to uh, this Q&A webinar on the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. Uh, my name is Terry D'Souza and I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service. Um, today uh, we have a Q&A session on business skills and training and it's one of eight Q&A sessions that we're running during the 10-week public consultation on the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. Um, we are very pleased today to have um, two other people uh, join me. Uh, we have um, a colleague uh, who's been working on the plan and also somebody from the Council's Economic Development Team. Um, and I'll introduce those, uh, both of them to you in a moment. Um, this Q&A session um, is intended to be an hour long. Uh, it will start off with some introductions and some housekeeping about how it will run. Um, and then we'll have a short presentation on what the area of action plan is, how you can get involved in the consultation, and also um, give you um, some idea of what we're proposing in terms of business skills and training uh, specifically for this area. Uh, because of the, the way that the Q&A sessions are run, they're all themed into different topics. So this one is on, uh, on jobs essentially and skills and training, and we really hope that the questions that come forward are specific um, to, to this topic area. Um, towards the end of the session, we will list all of the other webinars that are coming up, um, and they are also themed. Uh, and then there's one final one just a couple of weeks before the consultation closes, which is a more of a general Q&A where it is open to a, a range of different topics and, and discussion points. Uh, so uh, no further ado, I will pass over to my two colleagues that are joining me today. So first over to Matt. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Patterson. I'm one of the project leads on developing the Area Action Plan for the Shared Planning Service. Thank you. And Joanna? Hi, I'm Joanna Davis. I'm Economic Development Officer. Thank you. So uh, so my colleague Matthew is just going to run through the presentation in the moment. It's relatively short uh, and hopefully gives enough time to answer any questions that come forward. Um, in terms of housekeeping, just to let you know that uh, once the presentation's over, you'll be able to ask questions. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A button. So if you click that uh, and then type in your question, um, we will then be able to pick those up. Um, there isn't a chat function on the Q&A, so it is essentially you ask a question and then we will do our best to respond to those. To respond to those. Um, if we do run out of time, then what we did in the previous session was that we recorded uh, those, those questions we took them away and then we posted a written response to those questions on the website. So on the website after this, you'll have a video of the recording and you will also have a, 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 written, a written response to any questions that we weren't able to pick up in the time. Um, just so everybody knows, that, um, all of the attendees are invisible. We, nobody can see you. Um, and that uh, you can post questions anonymously. Um, so you're absolutely free to do that. Um, you can also use your name to post it, but we won't be reading out any names as we're answering the questions. Um, okay, so I'm now going to pass over to Matt, who's going to run through the presentation. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Terry. Right. So today's presentation is just on uh, business schools and training, but before that, we'll just give you some background to the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. Next slide. So. To provide some context, it's a very large site on the edge of the city and it's all brownfield land. It has really good uh, transport accessibility. It has Cambridge North Station, the guided busway, Chisholm Trail, and uh, the area will benefit from further improvements that are planned, um, including the Ely to Cambridge uh, mass transit. We've got uh, the greenways coming down from Water Beach and also the Cambridge Autonomous Metro is planned for here as well. It's only a 15 minute cycle ride from the city centre, so very accessible. Um, we have a range of landowners, so unlike some of the other um, major developments across Greater Cambridgeshire, um, here we have a number of landowners and therefore we need a plan that brings all those landowners together um, and ensures development across the whole area is coordinated, works together and fits together as well and um, delivers on the aspirations that we share for the place. Um, the area has a long history of employment use, in particular the science park and business parks um, that have um, added to the what is known as the Cambridge phenomenon and we want to see that continued but we also want to see um, the area developed further, more integrated as well 
becoming more of a part of the city. Um, but it is significantly still strategically important to um, the wider economy of the area. And we'd like that economy to um, have further flow on benefits really to those in the local surrounding communities. Next slide. So what's an area action plan? Uh, well, it, essentially it's, it's a framework that we'll put together to help guide development in the area. It sets out what our aspirations for the place are and we hope that um, as development comes forward, it delivers upon those aspirations. So it sets out clear policy expectations, objectives that we want to see delivered and obviously the vision for the, the long-term vision for the place. An area action plan has the same status as the local plan. It goes through exactly the same process, it's subject to an examination in public as well. And it's supported by a raft of uh, evidence-based documents that have been prepared to support the plan. Next slide. So what's our vision for North East Cambridge? Well, we want the place to be an inc inclusive, walkable, low carbon and new city district with a really lively mix of homes, workplaces, services, social spaces, all fully integrated with the surrounding neighbourhoods. That's our vision. So these are just some of the headline figures. On your screen, you'll see what we currently have on site, which is um, about 15,000 jobs on those science and business parks. Um, we only have three homes currently. Um, and, and mostly we have a lot of unused car parking spaces as well. But in the future, we wanna see about 8,000 new homes delivered in the area, 40% of which we is our target for affordable housing as well. We can, through intensification of some of the employment uses and, and employment in some of the housing sites as well, uh, we can see the creation of around about 20,000 jobs. Uh, we realize that um, the area needs to provide for public open space as well. So we're providing at least 10 hectares in strategic open space as well as other spaces that will come forward. And there's a raft of um, other uh, social and community facilities that will be required in the area to support that new development, including primary schools and library, and, and like we said, uh, improved connections, uh, walking and cycling connections in particular. And we want the place not just to be about uh, the tech industry and R&D and business, but it's about uh, a place for everyone. Um, we also are recognising that uh, industrial land uh, plays a really important part in, in what is a sustainable economy for the local area. So we want to retain that industrial land within the area as well. But we want to also bridge the gap between industrial land and the R&D sector by providing a much more broad range of businesses, creating jobs for uh, a lot of local people. And to support that as well, through the construction and post-construction phases, we're looking at training skills and investment to ensure that local residents in particular have that opportunity to access those local jobs that will be uh, created on the site. And as I said, we're looking to provide 10, uh, at least 40% of the housing uh, as, um, as affordable housing, um, and then a mix of housing across the board as well. But that affordable housing uh, can meet a wide range of different social housing needs. So the key aspects of uh, the proposed business policies is a significant amount of new floor space to be added in. Um, and like I said, this is to be a, a mixture of different types of floor space. We're talking about intensification on the existing science and business parks, but beyond that, we're talking about providing a much broader range of different types of um, employment floor space for startup businesses, small to medium enterprises, um, and, and more affordable floor space as well. And we hope that that will then ensure that those smaller businesses have access as well to um, the likes of what's going on on the business and science park too. Um, we've got some maps that show exactly where those new employment floor spaces are to be provided. Um, we've also got maps that show where the industrial floor space can be reprovided as well within the area if it can't be reprovided on the existing sites that it's currently on. And um, we have what's called a trip budget. 
that applies to the area, which ensures that we don't get any net increase in traffic as a result of all the development we're putting in. So that trip budget also applies to any commercial development that's put in. So all the employment for all space has to comply with that trip budget. Um, like I said, there's, there's lots of um, local employment and training um, opportunities of, that we will make available through the AAP process to ensure that local people can access those job opportunities as they arise. And lastly, we're looking at obviously digital infrastructure is really important and ensuring the place is uh, well connected in terms of people's ability to access data and other things. So this is a slide that shows essentially where the businesses will be created. Essentially, um, you're looking at intensification within the science park, so that's the additional floor space there, but also a diversification to ensure that there's um, amenities for those workers as well, and local services. So you're talking about shops, and you're also talking about leisure provision too within these areas. Uh, likewise, uh, on St. John's, which is just to the, uh, sort of north in the corner by the A14. Again, uh, that's an existing business site and you're looking at further intensification of that, but also again, further amenities to, to um, meet the needs of people that work there and live locally. Um, the other site, current business park is, is sort of in the main body part there. Um, so again, you're looking at a range of different types of uses. Uh, with business forming part of that kind of overall mix. And then down on Nuffield where we've currently got industrial land, some reprovision of that if possible on site and where it um, doesn't add to local transport risks or issues or relocation of that as well elsewhere within the scheme. Thanks. Um, to ensure that the area is truly a walkable, sustainable um, district, we are proposing four new kind of centres of activity. The main one is a district centre that sits on the, the main spine road, if you like, that runs between Cambridge North Station and the Cambridge Regional College. The district centre itself is to be located sort of at a, at a point midway between Cambridge North Station and Milton Road and will serve as a focal point for um, people traveling through the area. Um, we also have smaller retail and um, centers of activity, obviously one located around the station to serve those that are using that area, which will be a key transport interchange. Uh, one further towards uh, the top of Cowley Road near um, the business park, again, uh, ensuring that everyone within the surrounding area has really good access to local shops and provision. And one further down towards uh, Cambridge Regional College, between the Regional College and the Science Park, that will serve both those sites, but also um, the area surrounding in terms of King's Hedges, which has a lack of provision currently. And what we're aiming for is a range of different types of shopping units, but mostly smaller units that um, meet local needs and can provide for a greater uh, number of independent traders as well. In terms of land use, this map shows the, the detail, if you like, of where we propose the different land uses to go. You'll see at the very northern part of the site, if you like, or area is still Cambridge Regional College. It remains there. Beside that is the small district. Uh, or local centres, if you like, that we're proposing to serve those. The uh, science park uh, remains relatively um, in its current form, but more intensified in terms of its current use. And as I said, with some diversification in terms of providing greater amenities for workers and local residents too. Um, as you come across Milton Road, uh, you've got St John's to the north again which is primarily a current business park and, and is subject through the plan to intensification with some retail provision there as well. And then the bulk of the area is a very mixed use area, if you like, um, that includes both business space along the main road, the main spine that we talked about along 
um, Cowley Road there uh, that will also provide uh, most of the retail provision in terms of and local service provision on it. Um, beyond that, you you kind of get into more um, either residential led development that's a mixed use still with businesses and other types of uses within it, including uh, schools and other social provision. And on the other side, uh, more business led, but with again, mixed use with housing and other uses. And certainly around the station, we see that with a combination of also um, obviously retail provision. And then the aggregates yard has to stay where it is. Um, and so to help mitigate the impacts of that, we're looking at sort of a, a barrier of um, industrial uses that will line around and sit around that aggregates use and ensure that um, the noise, dust and other things from that are not impacting other uses in the wide area. Um, so we've talked about mixed use development and this slide just demonstrates kind of what we mean. I think we may have lost Matt on that one. So, um, yes, yeah, so can we just go back a slide? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so this um, sets out how you can um, how you can deliver mixed use development, uh, taken from examples from elsewhere. Um, so this is really thinking about um, not just having, you know, a housing block next to an office block next to uh, an industrial sort of kind of warehouse or shed. It actually shows how you can start to stack these uses or co-locate these uses in different ways. Um, you know, we've looked at examples from not only the UK, but also around um, around Europe to see how, how this is done elsewhere. And there are some really, really good examples out there. Uh, and those have all been documented in what we call our typology study, uh, which you can find on the website. And we can we can share the link to that as, as, as part of this uh, part of this webinar. Apologies, <laughs> I dropped out completely. I don't know what happened. No Technical glitches. Anyway, I have to continue on. <laughs> Do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah. And then Matt, do you want to just talk through this one, Matt? Good to have you back. Yeah, I will. Um, so just to finish off, these are some practical examples, some, some real life stuff that's happened in terms of mixed use development. Uh, so in the top corner, uh, right hand corner, you can see this is a uh, Travis Perkins on the ground floor with um, uh, residential accommodation above. So houses above it, and that's in Camden. Um, then we have to the left, you've got um, commercial space with affordable workspace. Um, and houses, that's as um, Bernard Works, which is in uh, South Tottenham. Um, down the bottom there, you've got Caxton Works, which is uh, light industrial on the ground floor, the residential above. And then the final slide down in the uh, right hand corner is um, homes with shops on the ground floor and even a, a cinema provision within there as well. And that's in Walthamstow. So on to some recently asked questions. Yes, thank you. Yes, so we've had a few questions uh, already. Um, some of these are coming through social media uh, and we just wanted to pick up the kind of the top three um, that have come up in relation to business skills and training. Uh, so Matthew and Joanna are just gonna um, talk through these ones. So the first question is from Matt and that is, what kind of jobs will there be? Yeah, fantastic question really. Um, there's going to be a significant range of different types of jobs created as a result of developing uh, Northeast Cambridge. Um, this will include both uh, jobs through the construction phase, but also post construction jobs too. For the construction phase, uh, we're looking at the widest range of jobs from those required for engineering, serving, draftspeople, uh, site managers, all manner of kind of skilled labor as well, including plumbers, electricians, builders. Um, and to maximize those opportunities, we're looking at what training and apprenticeships we should be promoting now to take a full advantage of those in the future. Um, and to ensure that youth within the area can see that there are, will be, um, job opportunities and access to those jobs within their immediate areas. In terms of post-construction, 
um, obviously within the area we're providing, as we say, a range of different employment uh, opportunities. So within those, certainly there'll be employment opportunities within the business and science parks. Um, but alongside all of the uh, employment floor space and housing, there's a lot of um, social and other commercial provision that will go in. Um, so there'll be a wide range of jobs in terms of community um, services provision, uh, people to operate and organize our cultural provision as well and to run those. And obviously um, with a significant amount of open space that will be provided, um, jobs will be created through those as well. Thank you, Matt. Okay, and the second question that came through from social media uh, was what will happen to the existing businesses in the area? And hopefully Joanna will be able to answer that one. Yes, um, just to reiterate really what Matt said in his presentation, um, um, North East Cambridge is a strategically important economic driver for Greater Cambridge as a whole. And as such, there's um, tremendous demand for both um, uh, business space and housing in the area. So the Area Action Plan will be looking to protect um, the uh, uh, existing employment space and to increase it um, to um, take account of um, future, current and future demands. So that would mean um, for office and uh, research and development space, there would be uh, an increase of over um, 230,000 square metres of space. And for um, industrial um, floor space where um, the um, Cambridge area has seen a reduction over the last 20 years of 35%, uh, we would be looking to um, protect the space and um, uh, consolidate the industrial space uh, and potentially we provide it across the site. So um, the, um, the main aim so if for businesses um, affected by um, any of the redevelopment, the council would be looking to work with them to look as if to see if they can remain where they are or potentially um, space be reprovided across the uh, North East Cambridge site. Great. Thank you, Joanna. It's really interesting to hear that the city's lost about 35 percent of its industrial floor space over kind of the last sort of 15 or 20 years. So it's quite a quite a significant amount there. Uh, okay, and then the, the third question is, uh, what are the plans for the science park? Uh, Matt, I think you've already touched on this a bit in your presentation already, uh, but if you just wanted to just, just for anybody just joining um, the webinar, if you could just give a very brief kind of answer to that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So as Joanne says, the science park's really important as part of the wider uh, Cambridge phenomenon, and we want to see it continue into the future to um, support the greater growth, economic growth within Greater Cambridgeshire. Uh, how the AAP does that is to promote it for greater intensification. It's um, a relatively un underused site. It has um, not much by way of, the, of built footprint and it's mostly car parking. Um, so there's significant opportunity to look at intensification and further development within the area and alongside that to provide for further amenities in the way of shops and leisure facilities to um, serve both the workers, the new workers and existing workers within the science park, but also um, that would benefit um, residents within the surrounding communities as well who would have greater access and permeability into the science park to um, make use of those facilities. Great, thank you, Matt. Okay, so um, we haven't had any questions put into the chat yet, but just to remind anybody who's just joining us, um, at the bottom of your screen, you should have a button that says Q&A, and if you have any questions that you'd like the team to answer, uh, then you can post them in there, and we will do our best to try and answer those um, as much as we can. Okay, but in the meantime, um, there is another question which I was hoping Matt you might be able to help us with and that is how can planners influence what sort of training opportunities are available? I can't really see a link between planning and education or training. Yeah no there's a significant link really um, and we do it. it's done elsewhere and certainly done in Cambridge currently. Um, in essence when new development comes forward and obviously through an area action plan we're 
planning for that in, in advance and, and, and therefore gives us further time to look at what might be the training and, and for construction in both post-construction phases, what will be the job opportunities. And then we can work with uh, colleagues, both within economic development, but outside the organisations of the councils, if you like, um, to those that are gearing pe young people in particular up with the skills they need. Um, and then through the planning process, we um, can, through planning obligations, currently secure um, job opportunities through construction phase and even into the post-construction phase. So. Uh, those are secured through legal agreements where the developers sign up to um, take on so many uh, local workforce, uh, to utilise the local supply chains, to um, take on apprenticeships as well. Um, and because we know the landowners here and the developers here, uh, we're looking to work with them very early before they put forward proposals and to start to put and embed some of these training initiatives into place and work with the likes of the Cambridge Regional College um, to see what courses, skills they can bring to play as well. And then obviously to roll that out and, and into the local schools and other places to ensure that everyone understands what opportunities may be available uh, and could look to take up those opportunities. Thank you, Matt. Um, Jo Joanna, a question for you is the plan talks about uh, incubator spaces and grow on spaces. Uh, would you just be able to give us a flavour of kind of what that means and what type of businesses that those kind of spaces might kind of apply to? Yes, um, uh, we've done some recent research around incubator um, demand and supply in the Greater Cambridge area. And the outcome of that was um, that the, a lot of the spaces that exist at the moment are uh, either full or, or close to being full. So um, a part of the reason for that we understand is that there is a lack of grow on space for businesses to move on to from the incubators. So we see that um, incubator space, uh, providing additional incubator space, there's a demand for that. So small businesses, uh, startup businesses, um, who who don't want to be tied down to um, uh, long leases and, and want the kind of easy in, easy out access um, to business premises. Um, so those spaces would support those businesses. And then when they're ready to grow, um, the incubator spaces would be flexible, but there is a stage at which a businesses, business would need to move on to um, uh, larger premises. So um, when that happens, we want there to be space available um, for those businesses, not necessarily so that they don't have to leave the area and then they can remain in the area, connect, stay connected to the businesses that they've connected with through um, being co-located. So it, it, it's it's a really fundamental um, importance that businesses are able to um, start up and grow within the same uh, geographical area. That's great, thank you Joanna. Okay, and another question is, are we mainly talking about more office-based jobs for people who will be paid enough uh, to want to commute in from as far afield as Peterborough or Ely uh, or kind of North Essex? Or can you guarantee that there will be jobs for local, local young people without experience? Um, is that something you might want to take on, Matt? Yeah, sure. I think, um, yeah, through the employment floor space that we're providing, we are providing a, quite a significant amount of intensification within the science and business parks, and, and they will be uh, primarily office or R&D floor space. But even then, there are significant opportunities for people to um, access those as well, and there is outreach programs that the Science Park is currently running. Uh, in particular with local schools, about um, what kind of things go on within those parks and how local teenagers and others can look towards a future where they could potentially work within those areas. Um, alongside that, obviously, with any employment floor space, there's a wide raft of, of different job opportunities that arise um, through servicing of those facilities. Um, but what we're talking about within North East Cambridge as well is a diversification of the job offer and the types of 
employment floor space. So we, we're still looking at retaining all of those industrial land and industrial uses. So they will continue to provide job opportunities in particular for, for those within the um, surrounding areas. Um, and as Joanna said, uh, we're looking to promote obviously um, uh, SME, so small to medium enterprises coming here, taking up opportunities to uh, work between, if you like, even the industrial type uses and and the more um, techie uh, R and D stuff, um, and for which there there is a significant demand, um, and they will obviously look towards uh, the local workforce in particular, and part of providing a, a mixed use development here is to ensure that actually some of these workers don't have to travel, that they have the opportunity to live and work in the same area and making that accessible too. Thank you, Matt. In, in your presentation, there was a couple of slides on mixed use development and you mentioned it again then. I suppose the question is, is about how, how easy is it to deliver these kind of mixed use developments? Because, you know, you traditionally get house builders or you get, I don't know, commercial builders, you know, how, how, how easy is it to kind of deliver the council's aspirations for, for this site? Yeah, I think if you'd asked me that question about, oh, even five years ago, I'd say really, really challenging. But actually, it's becoming more the norm. And we're seeing it more and more in, in cities across the UK and, and England in particular. And, and certainly in London, it's, it's very much the norm, which is to deliver um, a, a stratified mixed use scheme with appropriate uses um, throughout. So ensuring that you maximise the use of the land uh, for both um, jobs, servicing, as well as housing. Um, and it provides uh, good amenity for those who are living within the area and lots of activity as well, which also ensures that the area itself has uh, support in terms of the facilities and social services that are provided to support those communities. Um, and you get both the daytime and evening activity in the area, so you get good surveillance as well. Um, and through modern construction uh, and layout, of buildings in particular, um, you don't have any adverse impacts in terms of uh, sensitivities between, say, what's going on on the ground floor and the uh, environment that is provided for the residential accommodation as well. So uh, more and more, Terry, it's becoming um, uh, the norm, if you like. Great. Thank you. And yeah, as I said previously, um, if anybody wants to look at some more examples of how you can achieve mixed use developments, um, please do take a look at the typology study, which is on, on the website. Um, it's a, uh, I've mentioned it in the last Q&A webinar that it's a, for a planning document, it's a relatively easy read. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a good one to sort of pick up and flick through uh, if, you, if you get the opportunity to. Okay, we've had another question. This is to and from the employment space. How will existing car parking be affected by redevelopment and or intensification? Uh, Matt, is that something you might be able to help with, please? Yep, that's definitely for me. Um, and what we want is as more employment floor space is added into the likes of the science or business parks, that uh, conversely, the amount of car parking and access to cars is significantly reduced. Um, and that will be achieved through all of the transport means that we highlighted earlier in terms of we have excellent connectivity currently. Um, and it's about ensuring that people have an alternative to bringing their car to the office really, or um, that, well, they have an alternative in the first instance, and then they take up that alternative and are motivated to take up that alternative. And that is by not having car parking freely available within the office built areas, really. Um, and that will ensure that we can maintain that trip budget whilst also enabling further development in the area to happen. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I think it is worth highlighting that on, on the kind of spatial framework, which is kind of the kind of um, how the do how the how the district could be laid out kind of diagram in the plan in the area action plan it does sort of highlight where you could put um, these new business spaces um, across the whole area 
and we're really keen to try and make sure that we are putting kind of the, a lot of the employment uses on those kind of hot routes. And when we say hot routes, we mean the routes that are well served by public transport, the, the routes that are well used by people that are walking and cycling. So thinking about places like the district centre, which is broadly where the um, golf driving range is at the moment on Cowley Road. So that's within walking distance of the guided busway in Cambridge North Station and Milton Road, which is already served by the park and ride bus. Um, and also, you know, um, putting employment spaces close to um, some of the existing uses as well. So St. John's, the Science Park, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Business Park as well. So um, really trying to, you know, work, work with what's already on the site, both in terms of the land uses and the transport in the area at the moment. Yeah, just to add to that, and there is a role obviously for the new employees to, to take up and, and also the employers in terms of what they may offer to their staff in terms of encouragement through um, uh, travel plans that will be put in place but also ensuring that when new development comes forward, it has the right facilities in terms of showers, lockers, and those things to promote cycling, um, secure cycle, cycle uh, storage and, and the like. So um, the expectation is as well that through the AAP, we're really driving down um, parking standards and parking requirements on site and ensuring that those are maintained and managed in an appropriate way to uh, facilitate a, a really walkable neighbourhood. Thank you, Matt. Um, and another question is about um, affordable workspace. Um, so the plan references affordable workspace. Um, can either Matt or Joanna give us an indication of what that, what that means and what that would apply to for the area action plan or for the area? Joe, and do you want to do that one, or I'm happy to? At least after you, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so typically, um, where we see development coming forward um, with significant em employment floor space, uh, you, we can, as the councils negotiate, that part of that floor space becomes what is known as affordable floor space, um, and that is rent at much lower levels than the local area would normally achieve. And that's just to ensure that um, the businesses that would like to operate in the area but can't afford those rents have the opportunity to potentially access that floor space. Um, it's normally run by an operator who's an affordable workspace operator who has a list of people um, on their databases that would like to take up that kind of floor space, local businesses and the like. And it's, they run it really well in terms of um, those businesses have to demonstrate how they are um, taking up job, local job opportunities as well um, as part of their, their offer of taking up the affordable workspace. Um, and then they have to show how they're going to, to grow their businesses as well to move out of that affordable workspace to make it then available to someone else. Um, and essentially, uh, it's all secured through, again, uh, legal agreements and, um, and then managed on that. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Joanna, I've got a question for you. All of this development in North East Cambridge, what does it mean for Greater Cambridge in general, in terms of the Sphere Report talks about lots of growth and economic development, and we've already got a number of business parks and that scattered around. You think about kind of um, one in Water Beach, one in Campbell and et cetera, and then you've got quite a few to the south of the city. What does, what does all of this kind of, all of these jobs kind of mean for Greater Cambridge in general? I think the, the Spear report um, highlighted a number of key sectors um, in terms of um, maintaining and growing Cambridge. And the two key, two of the key ones were life sciences and um, digital sectors. And of course, the um, existing uh, North East Cambridge businesses, um, uh, those two sectors are uh, very key sectors for North East Cambridge. So in terms of um, its importance to um, the Greater Cambridge area, we would be looking at the uh, North East Cambridge development to um, help to um, maintain um, the um, uh, prominence of those sectors in the area, but also to help grow them. And But particularly life science is the um, key, um, one of the key drivers for location for life science businesses is to be close to other businesses and, and to cluster as a sector. So um, not, not, 
growing the, the amount of space that's available in the North East Cambridge will mean that we can uh, attract some um, new businesses um, to the area, uh, attracted by the space, but also by uh, proximity to other businesses in the area. So it, it is key that we ensure that um, we support our um, key economic clusters and um, our key um, providers of employment in the area. Cool. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, and obviously, with what's going on at the moment in terms of COVID and the demand for um, office space, um, obviously, you know, nobody's really sure about what's happening at the moment in terms of the, the wider world, I suppose, forget, forget about North East Cambridge. But, you know, has the council considered the impact of COVID and whether we actually need all of this office floor space and R&D floor space? Uh, Matt, is it something you might be able to help with? Yeah. I mean, when we started drafting this plan, obviously it was a very different world. Um, and uh, our aspirations for the place were, were around intensification of those uses, lots and lots of activity on site. Um, COVID-19 might, might change that really. And we are having to think seriously as councils, um, not just about the employment floor space and people going into offices, but even right through to housing and people working from home, ensuring you've got more space to do that and, and private amenity space as well. So that you have that good uh, access to open space provision locally. Um, so it affects a lot, lot of things and, and even right through to what types of um, leisure and community services and facilities we might put in. At the moment, we just don't really know whether COVID-19 is going to be with us for a short time or a very long time, what the implications are. And so what we've written into the front of the AAP is that unfortunately at this point in time, we're just going to have to maintain a watching brief. And we're going to have to talk to the um, business sectors about um, their growth aspirations, and but what that actually means in terms of uh, COVID and whether that would translate into requiring floor space, how that floor space is laid out, how you may have to still maintain social distancing, how you'll do all of those sorts of things. Um, certainly on the digital side, ensuring that um, Northeast Cambridge residents that take up accommodation here have access to, to ultra fast broadband and the like. So, you know, home working is still a, a significant reality for people as well. Um, and yeah, I think it's, we've got time before we have to finalize this plan and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be guided by um, what the government's telling us in terms of guidelines, but also just to, out there talking with residents and, and also with businesses about what the implications may be. And we'll, we'll have to write those in and we may have to be quite flexible on how we take the plan forward. Great. I was just about to ask you about um, what does the plan say about um, broadband speeds? Just because you, it was your internet that I cut out in the, uh, a few minutes ago, so I thought I thought you would be the person most, best place to answer that. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, I think sorry. the aspiration in the, is to deliver on ultra fast, so um, in particular, so it's full fibre. So you're talking fibre to to the house and to the business um, to ensure you can get ultra ultra fast internet connection uh beyond that we're also looking at digital connectivity across the piece so you're looking at uh you know this being an open wi-fi area um so you're fully accessible in terms of um we have our aspirations about how people will transition seamlessly between different types of transport to take up the um most sustainable transport options but at a, at a pace that really uh is accelerated so that those options are, are the number one choice really so having wi-fi and having digital connectivity is kind of in essence uh, a, a must for the area in terms of ensuring people have access to data so they can make real-time decisions and can transition with a click and get on an electric scooter or a bike electric bike to get to their destination know when the next bus is coming, know when the next train is going to pick them up. So all of those things require uh, a good digital platform to do it. Great. Thank you, Matt. 
Um, so on the screen now, you should be able to see the upcoming Q&A webinars uh, that are going to be taking place over the coming weeks. So as you can see there, um, on the 17th of August uh, next week, we have the third Q&A session, which is on climate change and water. Um, and then there's the general one on the 21st of September, which is a, a general one where you, it's sort of open to, you know, or sort of whatever, whatever kind of questions or things um, people would like to, to ask the team. Um, so, yeah, we really hope you can all join us for that. So we've got five more minutes. So I'm just going to um, go through a couple more questions that we've got here um, on the screen as well. You can see how you can actually get in touch. Um, so whilst these questions are really helpful and we hope that, you know, we are answering the questions that, um, you know, people are really interested to find to find out more about. Um, it's really important that any any comments um, that you have on the area action plan, positive, negative, neutral, um, please, if, if you can send them in formally through the process, um, um, more information on the website or via email or by post, uh, that's how they need to be uh, kind of um, sent to us so that they are properly registered and responded to. Um, that's just the way that um, this stage of the planning process works. Um, so um, we can't sort of take your social media comments, for example, as, as, as proper representations from, to this consultation. Okay, so um, just moving on to the final couple of questions that I've got here. So uh, one of the questions is about, it, will there be any restrictions around the type of businesses in the mixed use development areas? Uh, how can they? How can we ensure that the types of businesses needed by residents are provided close to where people live? Uh, for example, things like grocery stores and things like that. Uh, Matt, would you be able to help answer that one, please? Yeah. No, we're not looking at any significant restrictions. Uh, I think as long as um, what businesses go in in terms of mixed use developments ensure that um, you get a satisfactory environment for both the business and also the residential or other uses that are going to be co-located with them. So um, that tends to be managed through how you lay out the buildings and if requirements for soundproofing or other things like that. Um, in terms of um, provision of services in the area, um, yeah, that's why we're essentially promoting those these sort of four activity centres. Um, what we're not looking at is large format provision, say, uh, you know, one of these Tesco mega stores or something like that, that actually attracts lots of people in from the surrounding areas. Um, we don't want further people coming by car to do their grocery shopping here. Um, certainly, we're looking at smaller um, Tesco metro type arrangements where all your local convenience needs can be met. Um, you'll still have banking, you'll still have um, other retail service provision library, um, GP surgery, all those things that, that a community needs to be self-sufficient in terms of um, its everyday general needs. We're looking at obviously cultural and other provision um, that will primarily complement that that's already uh, taking place within uh, Cambridge City Centre, which again is highly accessible to uh, residents and businesses and workers within North East Cambridge by sustainable means. So you're looking at complementary provision. Um, and we're also looking at how we might facilitate, uh, obviously a lot of people do most of their um, regular shopping, if you like, online these days, in particular as a result of COVID as well. I think we've seen an uplift in that. Um, so we're looking at logistics hubs and last green mile type arrangements where your Amazon delivery package gets um, delivered to a sort of hub within this on the edge of the site and then it comes to your door via a, a green delivery um, for that last green mile or you may go and then pick it up you'll get the text message to come collect your your parcels and likewise we envisage the same thing will work for grocery shopping you would put grocery shopping and things like that Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay, and then I think we've got time for one more question. So we've got here, there's quite a culture of having client meetings in person. I think this is kind of related to the business um, kind of office floor spaces. So lots of occupants at business parks will be used to having people visit by car or using their cars to make sometimes two or three different client visits a day um, to all sorts of different areas around Greater Cambridge. Would the vision be that public transport would, would allow would improve to allow all of these visits to still take place? 
or are we looking at sort of businesses being encouraged to sub sub subscribe to car clubs um, so their staff didn't need all that all those parking spaces? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of those things. Um, if people can access the site by sustainable transport means, then then that's what they should be doing. Um, if they can't, uh, certainly for, for the workforce, if it needs to go out and, and visit other sites and do other things, uh, car clubs are the way to go. Um, pull cars and, and the like, um, and even pull bikes. Um, but if you've got clients who are coming from, from somewhere else that may be doing two or three stops along the way and public transport doesn't suit their requirement, then again, uh, there's no restriction on people uh, having visitor car parking. Um, and, and likewise, even for the residents who, who will be living within northeast Cambridge, it's not about not having uh, a car yourself or access to a car. It's about promoting the right sort of access to vehicles. Um, not everyone needs to have a private vehicle and a private car parking space. But again, you know, we've seen the benefits of car clubs and shared car pools um, that, that then reduce the need for car parking. And alongside that, uh, if we're promoting, um, you know, a greater uh, accessibility to public transport and improving cycle connections and walking connections, then we anticipate and we hope people will take up that as the primary first option, especially for those shorter journeys that should be done more sustainably. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Okay, we've just come to the end of the Q&A session. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody that joined live. Uh, for the event and also those that are watching this uh, recorded um, via the link on our website. Thank you very much. I hope you found it useful. Um, also, thank you to Matt and Joanna and uh, the team for um, answering the questions and also the technical support, uh, which has been great. Um, just like to just remind everybody that uh, please go onto the website if you would like to make comments on the draft area action plan. The consultation ends at 5 p.m. on the 5th of October. Uh, so that's the date for the diary. Please, please, please make sure your comments are, are in by then. Uh, and there's also a uh, Q&A webinar feedback form as well, uh, which you should have just seen the link to on the screen. Um, and we, you know, th these webinars are quite new to the council. We've done, we, we did one last week. This is the second one now for North East Cambridge. Um, obviously, living in a kind of uh, social distancing world at the moment, it's very difficult to do face-to-face -face consultations as we would have done previously. Um, so, you know, we, re we would really uh, appreciate any any uh, advice or any thoughts or comments on, on um, how these sessions have been running so we can take those into account moving forward. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>